What's good, everybody? Episode 19 of the Slip and Weave Podcast, the Emmanuel Augustus episode. favorite fighters of all time the drunken master the great emmanuel augustus um there's so much you can say about this guy as a stylist um as a performer as a guy that puts butts in seats and a guy who always gave you your money money's worth um but before i get into that i'm just going to briefly cover the uh the two cards that were on this past weekend on saturday one on espn plus at the mgm bubble one on showtime in the connecticut foxwoods bubble uh, the first one being one of my favorite young fighters right now, Robesi Ramirez, winning a very clear-cut eight-round decision against Felix Carballo. Carballo's last fight was against Shakur Stevenson, which was actually the first you know, podcast I did uh, post-pandemic after taking a couple of months off. And, you know, Stevenson was completely dominant. I think Ramirez, in this case, got matched with him as a chance to compare you know, two talented young prospects and get a gauge on where Ramirez is at. And I think what he showed is that he's not as offensive minded as Stevenson, but on a technical level and just purely his technique, his strategy, how he fights, that this guy is working on being a top level guy. Um, Still very early in his career. Obviously, you know, he's five and one, three knockouts. But you've heard me now talk about him on this show multiple times because this is somebody that I'm very excited about. You know, I think when they're watching him, when the commentators, Tim Bradley and all them are watching, they have very, very high expectations of this guy. So if his mentality is to fight a little bit more passive, um, I think that their inclination is to want him to go for knockouts, to do, you know, to be an aggressive kind of front foot fighter, or at least to press the the pace of the fight a little more. Which I see the value of that, but this guy's got some really tricky moves, man. It's almost impossible to hit him clean. You know, he's he mo- he's always moving back, taking short shuffles to create distance for himself. Um, and he always keeps you turning after he, after he punches, you know, he, he changes angles every time he gets off a couple, he gets around. Um, one of my favorite little subtle moves that he does is he'll be, he'll be in his stance, he's working, he's working and all of a sudden he'll just sort of drop and then he'll get back to it and then he'll boom, boom, he's moving his head, he's moving ahead and then he drops. And every time he drops, a lot of times it freezes the opponent. It's a weird little move, so he could be in the corner, whatever, and it's real unpredictable. But once he drops, it's almost like whoever he's fighting thinks he's, he, that he's about to throw something. And it's it's almost like a feint where he's like dropping to throw the right hook or he's dropping to, to roll out or whatever, but he really just drops and has you looking for a second. It's a very slick little move. I think that Robesi Ramirez is getting moved along in the right way, and I think that it won't be long before you see this guy um, in a fight of significance. He's, his skill level is progressing you know, faster than your average prospect because of his amateur experience and his pedigree. Um, the second fight was a fucking horrible heavyweight fight uh, between F.A. Ajagba and Jonathan Rice. I like Ajagba. I've seen Ajagba fight multiple times, man. I don't know what was going on in this one. This was a very, very sleepy, passionless fight from both guys. This was actually something I noticed in a handful of fights, particularly this last Saturday, is there are, I think, guys that are affected by the no crowd to a certain extent. Like, the adrenaline hit of that isn't hitting them. And so it's not that they're approaching it like a sparring session, but their mentality never gets more intense than that. This fight had that feel. There's really not much to say about this. I don't know where a Jagba is going to go at this point. Um, 
but this was a really kind of clunky, unathletic fight. And I think that he's got a nice jab. He's got some nice hand speed, some nice straight punches. Um, but he gets hit with the same shots the whole fight, and he doesn't make those adjustments to stop it. I mean, Rice was hitting him with right hands clean like three, four times every round. And he just never, like, his left hand never got higher. He just he never moved his head off the center. It was just the same thing over and over again. Um, you know, maybe it was just a bad night, or maybe this is just sort of his style. And the guy he was fighting with had a similar sort of style and mentality, and those two things just didn't mix. Either way, I think you're going to see a Jogba again sooner than later just because you've seen him on TV all the time. And I think that's going to continue. Um, the main event on this, Jose Pedraza and Javier Molina, um, was a really spectacular performance by Pedraza. Um, Pedraza, this was at junior welterweight. Pedraza is currently 28 and three, 13 knockouts, you know, has fought the best of the best, um, Javante Davis, Vasily Lomachenko, and you can see he's been taking notes the whole time. Like, there's a couple of things he does with his hands and with his upper body movement and his punch placement that's very similar to Lomachenko. And I think that, you know, he's only 31 years old. I, I don't think he's taken, like, a wealth of punishment in his career. And I think that that experience is starting to pay off in a serious way. Now that he's moved up in weight, it doesn't look like he has to cut weight anymore. His boxing IQ and his boxing skills are tremendous um he, like he's not the most athletic guy in the world but and he's not the hardest puncher either but his skills his timing his ability to land clean shots on the back foot and you know i hope that this guy gets a shot at something even if it's just a rematch with zapata you know sooner than later because i think his skills are great his head movement was great he switches from orthodox to southpaw seamlessly and can fight long stretches doing either um, so I think Jose Pedraza, especially with this win, you know, I know Molina had just beaten, um, Amir Imam and Imam is a good fighter. So I know Molina is a good fighter. I'd seen him before. And I mean, he just, at no point in the fight could he get in the mix. This was, you know, two different classes of fighter. And I think it, it shows that Pedraza is more than a contender, that he's championship caliber, and uh, I think he gives anybody at 140 a hard time, even if, it, if even if he just gives them a good, solid chess match. I don't think there's anybody at 140 right now that smokes this guy. He's too slick, man. Too slick to experience. He's seen it, man. He's seen it. Been there, done that. Um, so congrats to Jose Pedraza. I hope you get a shot sooner than later. This Showtime card was real fucking weird. Uh First fight was Jerron Ennis and Juan Carlos Abreu. Abreu looked terrible. I, I don't even, there's no other way to put it. I hate like roasting fighters like that, but Abreu really was sloppy and uncoordinated and not really competitive. You know, Ennis has nice hand speed. He's got like kind of all the things, but I can't really tell it, it, how legit it is because this opponent was so limited. Um, so there's not really much to say here because it was an ugly fight with a weird ending, um, you know, clearly Ennis is talented. How talented, I can't tell you, but he's clearly got the the stuff that you'd want a young prospect to have, and he's already got a lot of experience. He's 26-0, and 0, 24 knockouts, very strong, big welterweight. You know, I would love to see him in with somebody like Ugas or... Um, Maybe even Jamal James, someone that's a legitimate contender that knows how to adjust, that knows how to take notes as they go. Um, so who knows with that guy? The second one was Gary Russell's most recent opponent name. I'm definitely going to get this at least somewhat wrong. I believe his name is Tukstad Nayambayar. Um, fighting a guy from Barbados named Kobia Bridi. Uh, and he drops Breedy early in the fight, clearly has him hurt, clearly has way more uh, punching power and better footwork, cuts off the ring pretty nice, 
you know, clearly early in the fight, Nyambayar is the one with most of the advantages. Uh, better technique, better ev just everything. Um, and as it went along, his hands just got less and less busy, and Brady was getting off nice work, landing good combinations, and what looked like should have been an easy win for Nyambayar turned into a real struggle of a split decision. I don't, I mean, he clearly won the fight just because he hit so much harder than this guy, but um, it didn't look good. It was another case of like a really uninspired, slow, unengaged performance. You would kind of see him in the corner. His eyes had a weird look to him like, what am I doing here? Um, just looked very disinterested and Breedy looked like he really, really wanted it and was putting his hands together and making that case for himself. I don't think he won just with the knockdown, but not a good showing for Nyan Bayar. I've noticed um, sometimes with guys like that that hit so hard, they're a little enamored with their power. I think he just thought, like, I'll catch this guy at some point, and he'll go down, and I won't have to, you know, think about my strategy. But that wasn't the case. Some guys get up, and they want it, you know, and this was one of those. I don't know what's next for Nyan Bayar. We'll see. This was, uh, you know, I'd have to see him again. If this is how he's going to fight going forward, though, it's going to be hard for him at the top level, just not active enough. And then the main event was a junior middleweight title eliminator between Erickson Lubin and Terrell Gaucher. The winner of this fight allegedly is supposed to get the winner of Jamel Charlo and Jason Rosario Lubin winning a, a 12 round decision. This was a weird fight in the sense of the first eight rounds were pretty sleepy. Again, not a lot to go on. Not a lot of action, a lot of fainting. Both guys very slick, very good defensively, and very much like counter punchers. And the first seven rounds, there just wasn't a lot to go off. Everyone, someone will get a jab here and there, whatever. But a lot of it was, you know, just very uninspired. Something happened in the eighth round. I think Lubin, sent, Lubin uh, uh, clipped Gaucher. And the the pace just seemed to pick up kind of randomly and from the eighth round to the end of the fight it was a really exciting fight like they really went at it there was one point I want to say the ninth or the tenth round where Gaucher seriously hurt Lubin and I thought was maybe going to stop him but Lubin kept it together kept his composure stayed on his feet you know kept his defense tight enough to get through the round and then ultimately won you know, maybe the last two, three rounds of the fight. So, I don't, you know, Lubin, it's a little tough to know with someone as defensive as Gaucher where Lubin is because I love his skills, but it does seem like, based on this fight, based on the, the Jamel Charlo fight, it seems like he's a little chinny. And sometimes with somebody who's chinny, it's hard to tell, like, is this guy chinny or is he just open to get hit? With Lubin, I think there are weird times where his chin is sort of over that front knee where he's kind of leaning forward into his offense. So when he throws punches, he's he's got his whole balance shifted forward. You know, He's open for uppercuts. He's open for check hooks. Um, I think it's more of a mechanical issue than a chin issue with him. But obviously we'll find out over time. He's still 24, still a young guy, still a lot to build on, a lot of, you know, he's got a good foundation to work with. So, um I think it's I think it's only a matter of time before this guy's a real contender, but there is something about there's something to be said for sometimes getting knocked out changes your mentality about fighting. Maybe there's a little of that with him. You know, there may be a little of that like let's get through this fight without getting caught. And if you get into that thinking sometimes, you're too defensive, you're you're not, you know, taking offensive opportunities that you can put yourself in danger doing that as well. So hard to know for Erickson Lubin, but he is going to get his shot. So um, also a good reminder to, and I did a prediction of these fights last week, but definitely, um, definitely check out this pay-per-view this weekend with the Charlo brothers. A lot on the line in both fights and both divisions for both brothers and their careers. Um, and Erickson Lubin is a piece of that because he's going to get the winner of Jamel and Rosario. So, 
all that being said, let's get into my man, Emmanuel Augustus, for a second. Um, absolutely one of my favorite fighters of all time. And there's a lot of reasons for that. A complete showman. Um, one of those guys, you know, I've talked about jobbers a little bit on this show before. And essentially what a jobber is, is it's somebody who by no choice or fault of their own is consistently the B side of the fight, meaning that they're not necessarily expected to win. You know, it could be because their record's already bad. It could be because they're really not that good at fighting. It could be that they don't have any money behind them or any promotion behind them or any real support. And they have to be the B side if they want to stay active and stay getting paid. Um, and to me, and I mean this in a, in a respectful way because a good jobber, you know, is a, is a, is a talent. Um, this is maybe the greatest jobber of all time. Part of why he's the greatest jobber of all time is because a lot of times with these jobbers, they fight in a very defensive manner because they got to fight again next weekend. And so what they're really good at is survival, a lot of them. They're good at not getting hit. They're good at throwing just enough to keep you off. They're good at keeping space. But they're not necessarily that good at winning. They have good boxing skills that they can use to survive, but not necessarily like a winning strategy. And this Emmanuel Augustus guy, also known as the Drunken Master, is somebody who... I think from the very beginning of his career would go into all of these fights without a real support system, without a, a big promoter, without the network praising him um, as the favorite. It, it, it seems like from the very beginning of his career that that's something he had to duel with just being the B-side. And I think a lot of times guys who are always on the B-side, eventually they grow to accept that that role they grow to accept that I just go 10 tonight and I'm gonna I'm gonna try not to get nicked up too bad that was not the case with Emmanuel Augustus man it didn't matter if the guy had four losses in a row it didn't matter if he got stopped his last fight it didn't matter if you were undefeated and he had more losses than wins you know he showed up to win he showed up to entertain and he showed up to act like a fighter and to act like a champion um, and there's something really kind of special and admirable about that where, you know, so many of the guys that are successful in boxing have this machine behind them that's pushing them or, you know, that's helping to keep them on TV, helping to keep them relevant, you know, even if they lose and somebody like this, all he's got is his skills. He doesn't have those, those other forms of backing that so many fighters have. You know, all he's got is his fucking skills and his balls and his will to win. And sometimes that's not enough to get you the decision. Sometimes you're a smaller guy. Sometimes you didn't get to train for long enough. Sometimes you train too long and drain weight too much. You know, there's so many different things. And, and it's an unforgiving sport without that support. Well, it's an unforgiving sport if you have that support system. If you don't have that, it's like the Wild West. You know, you're taking calls for last minute fights and um, you're risking everything every time you do it. So, you know, in in out of respect for him and just enjoying his whole career and having watched a ton of his fights, um, I just kind of went through and I picked a handful that, you know, I felt like were really great examples of what kind of guy he was as a fighter, you know. There are so many more big names that he's fought that I'm not even going to touch on today. So if he's somebody you want to learn about, I would go on his box rec. I would go on YouTube and just kind of watch what he does. But, you know, the first one, uh, and I'm just going to go in chronological order. Um, but the first kind of big contender he fought was a guy named Ivan Robinson. And this was in 1996. Um... You may have seen Ivan Robinson and Arturo Gotti fight. And they had two absolutely classic wars that are in that Gotti war caliber. To give you context, I'm just going to give you the record just so you can get an understanding of just how much the B-side Augustus was. 
Also an interesting fact, when he first started his career, he was Emmanuel Burton. And about halfway through his career, his parents got married. And he took his uh, his father's last name. So he became Emmanuel Augustus. So early in his career, this was uh, July 21st, 1996. At 8, 5, and 2, he fought Ivan Robinson, who was 22-0. and 0, And I think was obviously outclassed in this fight. But it, it was just obvious that he wasn't the kind of guy who was just going to walk in and kind of lay down and take it. You know, he wasn't just going to... Um, follow the script if you will and he was going to be a participant in every fight you put him in I think you saw that in his his fight from 1997 against Dios Bellis Hurtado at the time Burton was 11 8 and 3 Hurtado was 21 and 1 the one being to Pernell Whitaker in a very very close fight you have to keep in mind you know these are world-class fighters so he he loses the decision to Robinson keeps fighting, loses a couple more, and fights Dios Bellis Hurtado. He's got this fucking wild, like, Cat Williams perm, and it's the first time I feel like you really see his swagger. He starts, you know, they call him the drunken master for a reason. He'll start dancing around the ring. He'll start jumping off both feet. He'll start, you know, acting like a marionette, and he's just, he's got this wild thing about him where it's like, why does this guy with all of these losses fucking with me right now? You know, like, he's not intimidated. He's not on the back foot. He's not running away. He's trying to win. I think that throws a lot of guys off. But, you know, Hurtado had very clean technical skill. Ultimately, I think a lot of times with Augustus fights, the judges weren't entirely watching and were just scoring off of the narrative or off of the record. Or if it's a close round, I'm going to give it to the guy with a better record. Um and there was some of that in this fight. He definitely didn't win it, but it was the first time you saw his swagger and his style and his uniqueness against a world-class fighter. Um, and not soon after that, he would travel to Finland and take on a guy named uh, Soren Sondergaard, who at the time was 38-1. and one. Augustus was 16-12-3. and three. This fight, he dropped Sondergaard twice. Uh, he's on the front foot bringing it to him the whole time, and he gets a draw. In a foreign country. Um, I think if you watch this fight, it's pretty obvious that that's not a good decision. And that's sort of the story of his career is showing up as the B-side, giving more than is expected. And even while giving more than is expected, um, you know, not really getting credit for that from the judges. And so you see the losses piling up. You know, as he goes along, you know, so he, he there's a draw in that fight. And then just a few fights later, he takes on an unbeaten guy named Terrell Finger and completely dominates him for eight rounds and stops him in the eighth round. You know, the announcers are saying they got to stop this fight. Augustus is just beating on him and da da da. And um, I think by then the the boxing world would have had to have kind of bought in on Augustus that. You know, you could bring this guy in, and if your prospect isn't the real deal, you know, he's going to get smoked. This is not a gimme fight. This is not a tune-up kind of fight. This is a guy who is playing by a different set of rules and is just more active than everybody and isn't afraid of his record looking like shit. Um, And speaking of prepared prospects, uh, in October 12th of the year 2000, uh, Emmanuel Augustus fought Floyd Mayweather. And I think you'll see multiple, multiple interviews where Mayweather says to this day that Emmanuel Augustus is the most uh, difficult opponent that he's ever faced. And it was the first time, you know, I'm sure for Floyd that it was the first time that there's somebody that's in his face just like making faces at him and poking fun at him and and kind of fucking with him a little bit. Now, Floyd was a much higher class fighter and would stop him in the ninth, but again, this is an example of him coming in as the B-side and just completely over-delivering. You know, I think everyone viewed that as a big big tune-up for Mayweather, and it turned out to be kind of a rugged fight where, you know, his nose is bleeding, he's taking hard punches, 
you know, probably some of the hardest punches in his whole career. And, uh, you know, and for Augustus, it was just another night in the office. You know, he's he was somebody who would just stay so busy. And, you know, with Floyd, he really wasn't afraid to get in his chest and take a couple and make some funny faces at him and do his little marionette puppet moves. Um, and it was, uh, it was kind of a special fight. It was kind of, it was kind of cool to see somebody push Floyd in that way that really was not expected to in any way, not a world-class fighter. Um, and I think for me, the fight after that, that really solidifies his legacy is his 10 rounds with Mickey Ward. Now, if you haven't seen this fight, Ward, I think, wins a unanimous decision with some really, really, really bad scorecards. But if you haven't ever seen this fight, it's on YouTube, and I highly recommend that you go watch this one. Um, In my mind, when I think of, like, the best fights I've ever seen, this is the best fight I've ever seen. The level of action for 10 rounds straight, the pace... um, You know, a lot of the fight is kind of just Mickey pinning Augustus on the ropes and Augustus sort of punching in between Mickey's shots. And uh, that fight is almost like a fucking movie. I mean, it's just nonstop. They're, They're wailing on each other, you know, and ultimately it's another one of those fights where Augustus, you know, substantially over delivering and and maybe not getting attention from the judges because you could definitely make the argument that he won this fight um, by a couple of points, I would say. And there are scorecards in there that are, you know, seven, eight points. It's ridiculous. It's like they weren't even watching the fight. Um, And I, I think that that's just, there was nobody that could shrug that off better than him. I mean, how many guys get... A bad decision and it kind of changes them as fighters that wasn't the case for him he could just keep losing over and over again and it wouldn't seem to affect his approach or you know affect his next fight he had no um he had no conscience about that it's almost like a shooter that's been missing four or five six three-pointers in a row you know, great shooters don't have a conscience about that kind of shit, and that's how I look at Augustus. There's no conscience about his last fight. This night is this night, and if you have enough to beat me, good on you. But if not, I'm going to take it to you. I'm going to make you look silly doing it. Um, and there were stretches of the Mickey fight where he makes Mickey look silly. He makes a miss. He He's popping him with huge shots whenever he wants. He's dancing around. And it's it's truly one of the one of the great non-title fights to ever happen, in my opinion. Um, you know, in a career of those, the next one I watched after that was his fight with Levander Johnson. If you remember Levander Johnson, longtime like lightweight junior welterweight contender. Um, this was a this fight was outside. It was in like a hundred degree weather. You know, um, obviously at the time Johnson was trying to set himself up for something more significant and Emmanuel Augustus got in the way because at the end of 10 rounds they announced that it was a draw and it seemed like that was the right decision it seemed like Augustus was pressing on the front foot Johnson kind of working his jab you know being smart if anything you know trying to keep it at distance but just not really being able to and just Augustus's relentless pressure you know, he would get draws with these guys that are world-class fighters. And ultimately, somebody like Johnson would move forward and somebody like Augustus would keep moving laterally, basically. Um, And not too long after that, even after, you know, having that draw in that fight, he stopped a guy named Carlos Wilfredo Vilches, who at the time was 37-1, and was one of the top contenders for the IBF. He was in the top four. Why, I'm not really sure, but he was. And Augustus took him to school and won basically every round. Stopped him in the eighth round. And uh, I think really showed his pedigree. It's like if you're if you're faking the funk, if you're, if you're a paper champion, this is not the guy to fight. Because if, if you're not the real deal, that you have no chance with this guy. He will actually make you look silly. And this was one of those performances for him where he really made Vilches look out of his depth out of his element 
you know, and um, it was a very, very impressive win. And, uh, you know, there was a period after that where he went through a little losing streak and he lost four, four or five fights in a row. I think he went 0-4 and one with a draw. And he would come back on uh, July 19th of 2002 and win a completely one-sided decision over Alex Trujillo. And he won the IBF, I believe the IBF lightweight uh, championship. Not the IBF, the IBA. I'm sorry, the IBA lightweight championship. Um, and I don't, I don't think he was really expected to win in any capacity in this one. I think Trujillo at the time was looked at as kind of one notch under elite and, and looking for a title shot, looking for that next opportunity. And this fight retired him. I'm pretty sure he quit after this. I'm pretty sure that was it after this fight. Like if I'm like, that's how frustrating it could be to fight this guy. The guys would just stop fighting. They would just stop boxing. Um, and this this was one of those examples. Again, Trujillo was 23-1. and one. Augustus at the time, 27-23-6. And, and just absolutely schooled him. Um, Trujillo really, he really never got in a rhythm. He never got off. He could never get working regularly he couldn't land and by the time Augustus got dancing and grooving and doing his thing it was like one side of fight he's already going downhill and you're fucked um and in typical Augustus fashion he would lose his next fight by disqualification against somebody he was beating um uh, the fighter's name was Tomas Barrientes and uh, allegedly what happened not allegedly apparently what happened based on reading the box rec is that referee Lawrence Cole, my least favorite referee in boxing, um, said that Augustus was unresponsive in some way or wasn't looking at him or had cursed at him or was just not being particularly compliant and was winning the fight, and Cole disqualified him. Um, And he followed that up with a 10-round decision loss to Courtney Burton. And... That's arguably the worst decision I've ever seen. And I remember watching it, and Teddy Atlas is screaming about, you know, how there needs to be an investigation of the judges, and um, this is unacceptable, and talking to the commission, and, you know, it was just such a mess, and it was so obvious that he had beaten Courtney Burton. It was so obvious what had happened. And it was a, it was a relatively one sided fight, and it was also a fight where he had a point deducted for showboating. You know, a lot of times I think judges and referees just did not like how he carried himself. They didn't like that he was clowning. They didn't like that he was like not super serious about everything. And um, and I because ultimately I think for him, being an entertainer was more important than winning, good or bad. Um, I just think that was his priority, and so. You know, if and and I think he would, you know, he would psych himself up. He would get into his own little rhythm and and get in his own head and get hyped up and um and unfortunately, this was a fight that he completely dominated. And at the time, Burton was a top ten contender. This would have done a lot for his career, and um, he didn't get the decision. And it was another horrible decision in a career filled with horrible decisions. And uh, you know, that was a tough one. That was a tough fight right there. Um, A few months, actually about a year later, in July of 2005, he stopped a longtime contender named Ray Oliveira, and I believe he retired him as well. Um, Oliveira, you know, was a a top 10 guy at 140 for years prior to that, and I think the thinking was that Oliveira would kind of just ultimately be too consistent for somebody like Augustus, and, you know, he completely outclassed him. It's the most dancing he did in his whole career. It was it was beautiful to watch, man, honestly. And what wasn't beautiful to watch was I remember at the end of the fight, Oliveira having some sort of head pain and them having to stop the fight and him sort of like yelling in the corner and, um, and not being comfortable after the fight. So that part wasn't that great. But the performance from Augustus of just being vintage showman, dominant Emmanuel Augustus... Um, You know, that's probably one of his best boxing performances and most consistent performances. Um, 
and the last one that I thought mattered was eventually in uh, in September of 2006, Augustus would get a rematch with Courtney Burton and would win by stoppage in the eighth round. Basically wins every round, um, has short pockets where he's sort of, you know, not letting his hands go enough as he could do sometimes. But ultimately, I think this fight was sort of like the vengeance fight for him you know, of being able to right that wrong and being able to really show, like, you know, I am a better fighter than this guy. I'm at a different level than this guy, and I'm going to, I'm not going to let the judges have a say in how this goes. Um, and even if Burton may, was like a little bit faded by then, it was, it was a great win for Augustus. And I think, you know, he had some, some more fights down the stretch of his career. He would lose his last four or five. But ultimately, for me, I think this was the fight where he kind of redeemed himself and, you know, at least righted the wrong of that fight. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing it in context and him, feel, you know, you could see that that was a super rewarding win for him. And, you know, later in his career, he would fight some really tough guys, you know, one of them being Ruslan Provodnikov and... Unfortunately, after he retired, he probably retired a few t- fights too late. And I believe he was in a car accident later um, in his life a few years ago. And he's recovered. He's alive. I'm not sure that all of his like faculties are still fully intact. Um, and But hopefully one day I'll be able to fucking talk to him myself and we'll find out. Until that time, you know... Um, He's one of my favorite fighters, and I really just wanted to take this episode to, you know, show my appreciation, maybe walk you through some of the history and some of the fights that this guy went through and um, just give you a sense of what a warrior he was, man. There's really not anybody like this guy anymore. There isn't a lot of, uh, there aren't a lot of successful journeymen like this because the record is so important, because having the zero at the end of the record is so important. Having a big promoter is so important. Having a TV deal is so important. You know, it's so hard to be a road warrior like this guy in any era. Um, And so I think that he's worth appreciating. And he's probably one of the best fighters that you haven't ever seen. If you haven't seen him. Um, So if you can, you know, maybe go through all the fights I talked about. And take a look at some of them. And, you know, just... uh, I hope you share my appreciation for somebody that, you know, in my in my young boxing life was one of the great entertainers of his era. So, um, yeah, that's it, guys. That's uh, that's episode 19 of the Slip and Weave podcast. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I appreciate all of you. And I'll see you next week, man. Peace.